huge. This land is our land Hey, red man, don't waste our time We're young and strong, we got hills to climb There's a lot of room, but we need it all For slave trades and shopping malls They're gonna build big factories For paper plates and plastic trees Styrofoam and antifreeze This land is our land This land is our land Patrick and you're uh, watching Native Life. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Oak Flat anniversary. That's the anniversary of the land swap that Congress passed in December of 2014. It was signed into law by President Obama. Uh, John, if you could get the um, slideshow up and we could get going on this. We've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. I'm going to be talking about the um, first the timeline of uh, how we got to where we are. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly cave block mining is, what Rio Tinto is planning on doing, and what all of the communities, not just the native community, I started out tonight with the song This Land is Our Land. Um, Bob Benvenuti uh, did the uh, cover of a Todd Snyder song and um, Neither of those people are native, and I did that on purpose. Um, it's This is a native and a non-native issue. This is a U.S. citizen issue, and the things that are going on need to be exposed to the light, and so we're going to give them some light tonight. Um, the Oak Flat time uh, land slot swap timeline, if I can get my tongue out from my eye teeth here, see what I'm saying, and how did we get here. If you go to slide two, please. Um, okay, 2014, so we'll go back a year. 
Uh, the uh, Arizona land swap was uh, never discussed in public. It was added during secret negotiations between the House and Senate uh, Armed Services Committees. The deal was never publicly revealed until it was uh, published uh, in the late hours of uh, Tuesday. And um, the, uh, the, the Southeast uh, Land Exchange and Conservation Act had twice failed to win support in the House of Representatives, and it was blocked by both conservatives and and um, and that just says conservatives and conservatives, but it was conservatives and uh, liberals. Uh, no one was happy with this bill. Uh, Rio Tinto, through uh, Resolution Copper, will take possession of the land in, this year in 2015. Um, there's supposed to be uh, there are supposed to be two areas that are excluded from mining, and that includes Apache Leap, and that's those big, tall uh, rock structures that you see in the pictures that you'll be or that are shown in the pictures this evening, and um, they but they can get possession of them in uh, 30 or 90 days simply by filing a request. Now the timeline is on 12-2 today, a year ago today, was made publicly available uh, with this, uh, the, the, the funding bill was made publicly available. On 12-11, uh, the defense funding bill passes the Senate, and on 12-19, President signs the uh, defense funding bill. Now during this time, there was a group of us, and I was involved in this on social media, trying to get anyone's attention, anyone at all. And as you all know, this is the holiday season. No one was expecting this. Um, it had failed twice. It was like one of these bills that had never died. And uh, they uh, snuck it in to the defense bill. And uh, John McClain, McCain and Representative Flake were the ones that were responsible for uh, spearheading this. If you go to slide three, please. So now we'll go back in time. In 1908, uh, this uh, land was uh, incorporated into the uh, Tonto National Monument. And um, in 1937, Oak Flat is protected. And I want you to notice that um, the, the National Forest adjacent to the boundaries of the Tonto National Monument, which are required for the proper care, management, and protection of the historic ruins and ancient cliff dwellings. So these, these lands that we're talking about here, Oak Flat and the surrounding uh, forest, <coughs> were put under the protection of uh, the federal government so that they could uh, make sure that the, the Tonto National Monument was protected. And Franklin D. Roosevelt himself said in the, uh, in the pro proclamation that he signed, is that warning is hereby expressly given to all unauthorized persons not to appropriate, injure, destroy, or remove any features of this monument and not to locate or settle upon any of the lands thereof. And that means Oak Flat as well. So there's a historical recognition going back to 1908 that this land was part of uh, an archaeological history, a past of a people. There were burial sites identified. There were archaeological um, uh, cliff writings and um, so on that were uh, acknowledged to be in that area as far back as 1908. So, uh, slide four, please. So, in 1995 to 2001, uh, Resolution Copper, which is uh, the way that the copper mining industry works and the way that most mining industry and even other extractive industries like gas and oil and so on, the way they work is they uh, develop a, um, a front company and they'll have uh, XYZ Mining Company. Uh, 
it'll be owned by Rio Tinto, BHP Bilton, um, Exxon, Mobil, whoever. But they'll have this this company, and the, the company does the exploration, it does the extraction, and then once everything's extracted, the company declares bankruptcy because its partners withdraw, and uh, the mess is left behind. And this has been repeated over and over and over again throughout the West. Um, so in April of 2001, uh, Kennecott, you'll hear that word, that name again later, uh, Exploration signed an agreement with uh, BHP Copper and um, they uh, started exploring uh, this uh, area and um, in 1990, it was back in 1996 that another group, Magna Co Magma Copper, uh, found this ore body that's underneath the uh, oak flat using you know various methods ground penetrating radar and so on and they're the ones that turned the um, the information over to uh, the other companies um, and uh, you know basically sold the rice out on it so in April uh, 2001 they determined that there was actually you know some sort of uh, ore grade they uh, they dug holes and extracted core samples and where the boundaries and how big this thing was and uh, in May of 2004 Resolution Copper Company had come into being and um, and at that point it was a wholly owned Rio Tinto subsidiary now it's uh, owned by Rio Tinto and BHP Bilton um, and in May 2004 uh, Rio Tinto um, had met so all terms established uh, in the earn-in agreement and uh, took control of the Resolution Copper project. Um, slide five, please. Okay, what was decided in 2001? This is what they decided that they were going to do. They decided this already before it was ever filed with the government or whatever, and this this is exactly what they're planning on doing. You'll notice the, the yellow kind of boxy square up in the right-hand corner. Uh, that's uh, where the campgrounds are. The boundary in red is definitely going to be collapsed. The fragmentary zone extends out to the yellow line, and between the yellow line and the green line, it's kind of iffy, and they may have to ask for extra permission to cause damage there after they've already moved, removed the stuff and the damage is occurring. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the picture of uh, what they're planning on doing. And you'll notice that this is a downgrade, so it runs from the uh, Apache Leap Cliffs down to a river. So there will be water running through the, this hole where they've exposed all kinds of things that they're leaving behind because they won't get everything. Um, and uh, so whatever's in the mine itself will be uh, getting uh, contaminated with the groundwater. The... Uh, the hole that they uh, leave will uh, fill up with rainwater um, and it will be an ongoing source of uh, uh, environmental degradation to that area. Slide uh, six, please. So, Resolution Copper is not, I mean, you know, these companies aren't stupid. And so what they decided on doing was rather than having to go through um, a bunch of the regulations, which include regulations that um, protect uh, native burial sites and archaeological sites and um, environmental impact statements and NEPA and so on, is they were going to get their hands on this land. They were going to take it private. And so what they did was they purchased several properties. The 7B Ranch is one of them. And so they they uh, purchased this ranch and uh, turned it over to the um, to to one of the environmental groups, and they established a bird sanctuary there, and so on. Um, according to the locals, the the land is not all that good, and it's. Um, you know, mostly window dressing. So they purchased this so that they could swap. 
so that they could get this put into a bill and offer to trade the Rio Tinto National Forest land that they wanted see previous slide and um, they, they, they would have this other land which was marginal at best and they would uh, they would say okay well you know this is an acre and that's an acre and let's swap acres so that that they, they were planning this back in 2004 as a way to get in well the first one if you go to uh, number seven this is the next year in 2005 this is the one of the many incarnations of this uh, Land Exchange and Conservation Act. And this one was introduced by Representative Rick Renzi. And um, not too long after, Rick Renzi was indicted on 35 counts of conspiracy, wire fraud, money laundering, extortion, and insurance fraud because... Um, he told Real uh, Resolution Copper that uh, he'd uh, use his position to put the uh, the bill on on the floor if um, if if they bought some land that he had to put into the swap, and he was going to charge them all kinds of money for that. So that just lets you know. And and I think that the reason this came out in the article that I found it in was dated after the 2005 bill had failed is that I think that um, Rio Tinto was mad because their bill failed and so uh, they went ahead and uh, leaked the fact that they had been uh, that someone had approached them to uh, solicit a bribe. Uh, eight, please. So, when the 2005 uh, bill failed, in 2006, the San Carlos Apache uh, Council passed a resolution opposing the land swap, and they cited all of the environmental and, um, and, and, and religious grounds, um, and there's a number of various acts. There's the Historic Preservation Act, Archaeological Resources, uh, Native American Graves, American Religious Freedom, uh, National Environmental, which is NEPA, you'll hear that a lot, and the Executive Order of 13007, uh, uh, which is the Protection of Indian Sacred Sites. They cited all of those going, okay, well, you know, we've got standing here, and we're going to pass a resolution that says that we oppose this land swap. We're going on record for it right now before anybody has a chance to do anything more. But the problem is, is once the land is transferred into private hands, none of these protective laws apply. So once this land is transferred to uh, Rio Tinto, which is going to happen in the next couple of months, um, none of those n none of those uh, uh, acts or laws, especially NEPA, have any standing at all. It's private land; they can do what they want. Uh, Slide nine, please. So then in 2007, here comes the Southeast Arizona Land Exchange and Conservation Act again. And um, this, uh, this particular article is from um, a uh, testimony that was given by the uh, chairman of the uh, San Carlos Apache tribe. Uh, and the 2007 was defeated. Uh, 10 please. Between 2005 and 2013 there were 12 attempts to pass Rio Tinto bills. So this is kind of like our uh, perennial law uh, defund or get rid of dismantle Obamacare. And um, it just it just keeps coming back every year, year after year after year, till finally they hide it in a uh, a must-pass national defense bill, and uh, it gets through Congress. So that's how we ended up where we are today. And uh, let me see if y'all got any questions here. Well, uh, John, if you could get the Cape Block Mining um, video together here, I'll look at the uh, comment sheet and see if anybody has any questions. Nope, no questions so far, so um...
if you can start but that. It's a great conversation going on. I like what people are saying in there. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Pat just tore into that, and that's a lot of information. But, hey, I was just saying it's a great convo. Yeah, you know, that's one of the neat things about this broadcast is that y'all could go back and look at it tomorrow. Um, I've uh, cited nearly all of my sources in the description, and if there's anything that um, you want to know more about, or need some pointers towards, I will be more than happy to get them for you. Just go to the website. It's listed at the top of the uh, description, uh, native-life.net, and there's a contact page, and all my contact information is there, how you can get a hold of me. Uh, Native Life is on Facebook. You can contact me there. I'm on Twitter. There's an email address, so, you know, short of uh, needing to send uh, a drone to my house, you can pretty much get a hold of me. And so, John, are, are we ready to go with that? Yes, we are. All righty. ...technique we'll use here, which is called panel caving, a subset of the mining method known as block caving. The animation which follows will show you how the whole process works. The ore body sits 7,000 feet beneath the desert floor and approximately one mile behind an escarpment or cliff known as Apache Leap. Here at the Resolution Mine, panel caving is the safest and most productive way to mine this deep, large, low-grade deposit. This will allow us to mine the most ore with the least amount of waste. The idea is very simple. It uses one of nature's strongest forces, gravity, to help extract the ore. In panel caving, we will actually mine from underneath the ore deposit. It's a three-step approach. First, go deep into the earth. Break up the rock containing the copper ore. Then create hourglass-shaped caverns to funnel the rock downward. And finally, remove it from the bottom. The first phase of the operation is called the undercut. After initial tunnels are created at the bottom of the ore deposit, a series of W-shaped openings are drilled and blasted. As the rock is removed from the undercut, it creates a large void and gravity causes the roof of the opening to collapse. Once a large enough area has collapsed and been removed, the cave will then continue to naturally propagate or spread upwards into the copper ore. Now the ore is ready to be removed. So in the second phase, we go down below the undercut and create a set of horizontal tunnels from which the ore will be extracted. After tunnels are created, vertical holes are drilled from the top of the tunnel into the W-shaped openings. The tunnels are then blasted, which forms the funnel-shaped opening. In the final, or production phase, gravity pulls the broken rock resting inside the funnel down through the opening. Automated loaders transfer the ore into trains and then dump the ore into crushers that further reduces the size of the ore fragments. Then the ore is hoisted and conveyed to the surface. Panel caving allows for the mining of very large ore bodies by dividing it into smaller strips or panels so that the ore can be removed in a safer and more efficient manner. Once a panel is depleted, the next adjacent panel is mined. This cycle continues until all the ore is mined. Working more than a mile and a quarter beneath the surface, each and every phase of the operation is carefully monitored. Just one example, engineers will constantly control the speed of the rock coming through the opening in the funnels by controlling how much is removed from each opening. around in circles and um, grind up the material. 
in. They are heavy. Yeah. So these are these are mill balls. Um, these balls will go in and they will grind up the material. So either through a braid or them on each other or um, with the with the dirt. Um, so it takes it from um, slightly large to to slightly smaller. Um, so in fact, typically around about this size or smaller. From there it goes on to the flotation circuit. And with the flotation circuit, <laughs> what we do is we add in some chemicals and reagents. And that allows the chemicals bind to the copper and make the float. So in the simulation you can see that the copper, copper's um, material floats to the surface. And um, okay, the rest of it sinks to the <laughs> <laughs> okay, So what happens with the waste? So with the waste, we put the um, tailings. Um, in the model, it's basically going through these pipes over um, to one of the drums. Um, in the mine itself, the waste will go, um, same thing, be pumped out and go to a tailing stand. And from the tailing stand, um, we'll decant back some of the water so we can reuse that. And one of their other big draws, the Arizona Trail, is going to be uh, sitting alongside a giant blowing dust pile. It is this giant blowing pile of dust that has the residents of Queen Valley concerned. Rio Tinto plans to dump the 1.6 billion tons of waste from their project only three miles upwind and upstream from their community. So while the Apache fight for their sacred land on the east side of Superior, here on the west side, this community has come together to fight for their homes. Queen Creek runs right through Queen Valley. It used to always run water. That's what I heard. It was always filled and now not. It's not. Right, because Resolution Copper is pumping a million gallons a day down to Florence, right past Queen, Queen Valley. And so the, the ecosystem along that river is going to be destroyed as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's not even counting the dust issues that we're going to have uh, and, and the air pollution that because of that tailing pipe. Yeah, it is a desert. It and blows. When, when I uh, ask the resolution about it, they talk about, uh, well, we're going to keep the pile dampened down. Uh -huh. Well, that sounds good to a lot of people in the audience, but all you got to do is, is figure it out. And if you put one cup on one square foot one time a day, it'll take 20 million gallons a day to do that. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to do it. Yeah. And so here's a here's an area that's part of Tonto National Forest that belongs to all of us, that they're going to put a tailing pile, and when they leave, it's going to be the responsibility of Tonto National Forest. In, in the sun, in the heat of the summer day, actually vaporizes the mercury in those tailings. It gets into the air, and it is turned into methylmercury, the most dangerous kind, and, and the concentrations actually blow off the tailings, into the, the neighboring area. So, potential effects on water. I think we've talked about some of these already. They can affect you in a myriad of ways. You can have these storm events. We can have overtopping, flooding, other reachings to the tailings impoundments. We can get the runoff carrying the tailings into waterways. And this is the Mount Polly issue, and this happens and can happen often. Uh, earthquakes and landslides and slips. That sounds really kind of weird, an earthquake, but we just had an earthquake, not a small one. Um, infrastructure failures. This is the pipes pumping, all of these different things, impoundments, and the acid mine drainage and seepage. And that really concerns me for you guys and for the surrounding community because there's not going to be a liner. What can we do? I mean, what can I do? Because I can't speak for everybody, so. You can't sit back and let these guys fight for you. Help these guys help you by educating yourselves. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the trails out here that they want to bury are some of the best in Arizona. We have people come from all over the country that come down here, and we think that's an abomination what they plan to try to do in putting this tailing pile in our backyard. And what really concerns me is I've heard comments by people that have said, oh, this will take 40, 50 years for the tailings to really start to affect people. Um, even if it is that long, we have a responsibility to generations, um, to our children and our grandchildren, to not let this happen. Um, it, we don't want to devastate the environment. And we have company. <laughs>
So the local residents decided to track down Rio Tinto and have a little talk. These are not going to leak and blow. We got to design them to where they don't do that. Or at least we got to be able to control them. You're putting a liner down there? Well, it, well, we'll talk about that. On the oh, liner okay. on this side right now, the, the current design does not have one. Okay. But oh. the reason why we don't have one right now is because if you look on surface, it's basically considered somewhat of an impermeable rock. Um, if you're on permeable rock, that means it's not going to leach in, it's going to surface run, correct? What are you going to do to control no, that? Well, basically here you've got controlled drainages that go through an impermeable rock along a ridge line. So basically you've got a series of canyons of which we've got to basically create what we call an actual water dam to control that. So you've got to put in grout curtains and build up a dam downstream of the actual facility and basically control it from there. <coughs> so all that seepage that, that would possibly escape through the embankment has to be collected and pumped back into the tailing spot. Have you and seen then have a way to what? clean the water when it comes out through the bottom of the dam or when you open the floodgates? Well that's where you have multiple levels of contingency. So you have dams built downstream of dams. Basically. And all the heavy metals will settle in the bottom <coughs> no, of those no, ponds. No, 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 no. Basically you know, that's, that gets a bit complicated and stuff like that, but we do a flotation process where we separate out the sulfur and sulfides and metals. And what do you do with them? We store them within the facility within the slime ponds. So basically they're a long ways from the exterior of the bank. Where are the slime ponds coming from? Right in the center of the facility. Of, of the, the facility. mine? You mean? Right where we're standing now. Yeah. This is it. This, this is, is it. where all the friends are going to be. Yeah. No, it's, it's ground sand. It's ground sand. It's 98% percent silver. Powder. You know, resolution tells you that the tailings consist mostly of sand, which is true. Uh, it's mostly sand, but there are some very nasty metals in it. This will go into the aquifer and will be distributed through the rest of Arizona, actually. Long-term exposure to heavy metals, which accumulate in the body and do not leave you, are going to eventually cause trouble. Trouble like cancer. It's like taking a glass of water and putting a little cyanide pill in the water. It's mostly water. Numbers going out there on how high it is. It doesn't get much higher than where you're standing. Well, the numbers thrown out there happen to be their own, and it adds up roughly to the volume of this mountain. And by their own admission and their own numbers, they are claiming that they're going to be the largest producing mining company for copper in, in North America. Well, you know, you've got to look at both sides of the issue here. If, if they're going to create that much revenue and tonnage and production of copper and other commodity metals, possibly, they're going to have to produce a lot more waste. I have been told and watched over my life, oh, it'll be fine, and it's not. And then whoever the company was, they go, bye-bye, mm -hmm. and it's over. And then, and then this beautiful, very, very fragile, very unique environment is ruined forever. And what are we doing to our environment and to our children and grandchildren? That's, that's my concern. I won't be here. Natural evaluations that we have to do uh, with the Forest Service. Over the last few years, uh, with funding from the Resolution Mine, uh, there has been an ongoing ethno-historic study of the Oak Flat area. Uh, in fact, uh, a very large area uh, extending well beyond Oak Flat itself to cover all the potential area that could be affected by the Resolution Mine project. But already, uh, Resolution has been trying to discredit the results of it and saying that Oak Flat is not significant to the to the Apaches, that it really doesn't have any importance, that it isn't sacred. And yet this flies in the face of every federal law that provides protection for these kinds of things because we have definitely identified people who have 
demonstrated that significance uh, through the interviews. So regardless of what they say about the project that they've been funding, it has very specifically shown how important Oak Flat is uh, to the Apaches and to every other tribe in central Arizona who not only have their own connections to the place, but who support the Apache and their connection to the place. Is this normal for the, for the U.S. Okay, okay, thank you. to let a foreign country come in and screw up the land? Like well, what is a foreign company nowadays? Well, not going over to China or Japan or England or wherever. Our biggest stockholders are Americans. They are. Look it up. So where does all this copper go then? It goes into a market. This group represents 25% of the copper uh, that the United States would be using. We're right now importing 35% of our, uh, our copper. And since this copper is going to be sold on the market by a foreign company, when we want some, we'll be importing it too. Because of all your neat designs you got down and say, that's perfect, it's going to break, and it breaks. Now what? We've got contaminated land forever out here. you got stuff going past that to the Gila River watershed downstream. You people take your toys, you go home to your homes, wherever that. And then at the end of mine life, when they're out of money, they're not producing any revenue anymore. If there are lawsuits, the subsidiary simply files bankruptcy and there's no recourse to the parent company. Trust in me, just in You see, I kind of wonder <clears throat> why a company would be willing to invest as much as you are on testing in all that the various aspects if, if you are pretty sure that you're going to get a go ahead. And um, so... There's some more of the story, and as this thing unfolds, as you watch all the stuff that we're uh, presenting here, it um, really, really, really makes you wonder about um, whose fix is in and uh, exactly what people are doing here. Um, uh, Jeanette asks who's done the graphics. If you're talking about the graphics on the <clears throat> Rio Tinto mining section, that actually came from Rio Tinto itself. Um, I've been using uh, materials from a lot of different places. You can find the resources in the um, <clears throat> description of the video of this broadcast. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. Erg says, how can someone even consider this? It's blatant environment damage for uh, corporate profits. Has any common sense been lost on these people? They don't care. They don't live there. They get to leave, as one of the people in that video noted. You know, once you're done, you can go back to your homes. We live here. We're going to be stuck with this. But the people who got whatever they got for putting this into the 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 Senate uh, or into the defense appropriations bill the people who got whatever they got for selling this lease to these people um, they don't care they have their money that's all they care about the, their only life value is to maximize the profit that's it anything else is just you know well collateral damage who cares um wouldn't uh wouldn't the earthquakes cause huge huge damages or goes on to ask uh yeah they sure would um the the the, the problem with the landslides is, is that they're going to build these um these what basically amounts to earthen dams which work relatively well in places where you can grow like sod and grass and you know plants that will stabilize the 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 earthen dam um in some place like Arizona I don't know how much you know about Arizona um weather patterns but every February 
February, March, end of January, they'll get a, a period of two or three weeks that's called monsoon season. And it absolutely pours down. And, you know, there's flash flooding and there's water in all of the places where there normally isn't water. And there's water running everywhere. And then after it stops, the desert blooms. It's beautiful. If you, don't, if you ever have a chance to go there around the middle to the end of February to see the desert blooming, it is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, but uh, all of this, that's why they were talking about, the locals were talking about, what are you going to do when you have to open the floodgates? Because this isn't just like, um, uh, it's a desert and it never rains. It has a very, very intense rainy period. And there's no way that um, the the dams will be able to hold. They'll have to open floodgates. And that means that the water will go downstream, go down, down the terrain to the next dam that they've built and so on, carrying all those heavy metals and things, the chromium, the cobalt, the, the uh, uranium. Uh, if you were around for our um, broadcast, I think it was the first one or the second one, that's the second one, on um, the Navajo uranium mine problems, and the, the devastation that's been there because of the uh, tailings and stuff um it's it's going to cause the same sort of problems for the town of superior and amplify the issues that for the people who get because this isn't far outside of phoenix this is maybe 100 or 150 miles outside of phoenix and they get their water you know and the water comes from mostly the surface but also the aquifers and the stuff gets into the aquifers um they're digging a great big huge hole this is going to collapse and it's going to fill up with water they're a mile and a half below the ground with their tunnels um they're going to have to pump water out of the mine because uh, they're going to be in the aquifer itself at some times of the year so this is a, a big problem um, has there ever been a case when it worked out like they said it would? Um, yeah, they, what they do is they, you know, it seems like they hire a salesman. And the salesman goes out with his, uh, with his whiskers spread like wings and his, uh, and his top hat. And he does a little dance, da 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 and everybody buys it. And there's no realism here. There's no, let's make some contingencies. Let's figure out what we're going to do if. Let's play what if, worst case scenario. They don't ever publicly, or even as you'll find out later, it seems like privately, entertain any kind of notion as to um, what could possibly go wrong. Um yeah, trust in me. Uh, Grandma Christine says, with them in charge, what could possibly go right? Um, so that's pretty much where we are, you know. Now this is what they're planning on doing. This is their 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 big idea on what to do next. And um, John, if you could bring up the uh, slideshow on. Um, who is Rio Tinto, uh, the copper mining, the copper smelting one, and get it ready to go here. And he's, he's getting it up. So this isn't, I mean, the mining isn't the only thing that they're going to be doing. Um, I found in amongst some of the stuff on the Rio Tinto Resolution Mine site that they're going to be smelting the copper as well. So you saw in that one clip where they bubble up the uh, using using um, mercury and all kinds of other noxious uh, chemicals. They uh, separate the copper from the 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 sand and the uh, the uranium and everything else that's in there, gold, silver. Um, they've they don't have a mining lease for just extracting copper. It's whatever they find in there. So you know, if they find appreciable amounts of uranium, they could 
go ahead and extract the uranium. They could go ahead and extract silver. They could go ahead and extract gold. There's no monitoring, uh, outside monitoring that's going to be going on on this uh, mine. It's all underground and it's all automated. There's not going to be any people down there. Those are all uh, little uh, automated uh, uh, loaders and, and uh, such that they have down there. The only people that are really going to be employed are the people that are uh, twiddling the dials up on the surface to make sure, hopefully, that everything runs right. And so uh, with, with once you get that part done, they take and um, further extract the uh, copper by running it, I don't know if people know too much about anodes and cathodes, but uh, they use an electrolysis process that uh, it's a chemical uh, process, not an electrical process, where uh, they uh, have the uh, copper attracted to uh, plates and then the copper skimmed off of those plates. Well, that copper is only about 30 to 40 percent pure and they need to get it 90 percent pure. And in order to do that, they need to heat it up really 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 hot um, anybody who is familiar from the rust belt of the uh, the the iron smelting and stuff that used to go on there has some idea about what I'm talking about here but uh, the the opening picture here I lived in Salt Lake City Valley for about two and a half years and they have an inversion problem there in the winter time and well, they seem to think that the only time that they have a problem is during the inversion. All this stuff is going up into the air. Uh, the inversion just traps it where you've got to smell it. But uh, this stuff is going up into the air. It's sulfuric acid, SO2. It's uh, a, a bunch of other really, really noxious and dangerous chemicals. And uh, as you'll see, Rio Tinto and BHP Milton have a horrible record on environment and safety. You can go to uh, slide two, please. Um, the smelting operations, um, PM 2.5 is the uh, level of pollution that's small enough to be inhaled. So it's not ash, it's not, you know, like from burning um, firewood in your fireplace, for instance. This is the, 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 the tiny particles that get down into your lungs and cause damage. And um, remember that they're burning copper that has a little bit of uranium in it, a little bit of nickel in it, and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Okay, so a lot of that waste is going right up into the air and you're breathing it and it's so bad and it, I can attest to this these are uh, the non-attainment areas they have already created in Utah sacrifice zones these are the areas which to one degree or another they will never be able to uh, get to uh, safe PM 2.5 levels and the majority of that about 35 to 45 percent of that is from Kennecott Copper. Kennecott Copper, who uh, is the name of the front company that runs the um, smelter, and uh, it's owned by Rio Tinto. So there we go, another connection to Rio Tinto, and not a very lovely one at that. Slide three, please. Okay, this one is so sad. I have videos for this, and if anybody with a strong stomach wants to watch them, I just couldn't, I mean, geez, it's December. Y'all are doing Christmas shopping and stuff. In November, On November 5th, a dam holding back the wastewater from an iron ore mine in uh, Brazil, which is owned by BHP Belton, who is the other partner now in this um, uh copper mining company. Uh, it burst, devastating a nearby town, killing 17 people. whole wall of contaminated water with um, iron uh, or tailings in it uh, took off. It devastated the nearby town. Uh, it injured 50, causing enormous ecological damage. And that was the videos that I was looking at. 
there was uh, it's a video of a group of uh, fishermen and they're helping with the cleanup and there's these big fish and I mean they're big fish and these they're all dead I mean they're dead stiff as a, as a board dead and the farmer and, and fishermen are grabbing these fish out of the water and one of them just finally he can't take it anymore he just breaks down in tears and is just sobbing uncontrollably at the dev at the devastation from mile after mile after mile on this river and it's it's all the way out into the Atlantic Ocean um, the plume can be seen from space from this mess and um, this is another example and this is what the people of Superior are worried about is what if one of these uh, what if this tailing uh, uh, pond that they're going to be building right on the hill above uh, above the city what happens if that thing breaches during the monsoon what happens if one of the walls or, or the dam part of it that's holding it back what if that falls down because of an, of an earthquake this is what's going to happen to them and they know it so you know I'm usually on here I'm advocating about you know the natives and this and the natives that this is a human issue the natives have a claim and leverage on trying to get this shut down but this is needs to be shut down for everyone's sake not just for the natives I mean if we need copper that bad I don't think so I don't think we need it that bad for please okay in April 2013 here's a tailing uh, a hill that uh, Rio Tinto put together and um, <laughs> it fell apart they had a, a mild earthquake and the thing took off and uh, it went everywhere all these tailings with um, uh, you know uranium and cobalt and heavy metals in it I, I, I like that one the the old doctor that was going you have a glass of water and it's mostly water and you put a little bitty cyanide pill in there it's still mostly water right and I look at this and I think you're doing this in an area you know at least with the Salt Lake, the 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 um, Bingham uh, Canyon uh, mine, there's a large infrastructure. There's a large city. Um, there's you know there, the valley is fairly well habited. Um, you've got roads. You've got ability to get in there and clean this mess up. For some place like Superior, they're no better off than that little. Uh, a little town in Brazil I just showed you oh uh, there's no recovery from that you go to slide five and this is um, um, a Rio Tinto that was going that uh, is called the Grassberg mine it's in Indonesia and basically the mine is up on top of a mountain um, they removed some glaciers uh, yeah removed some glaciers uh, actually there are glaciers in Indonesia and um, they uh, burrowed down as an open pit mine and this is uh, a record in LSAT from the LSAT satellites of the um, uh, leaching of the tailing ponds from that particular um, operation and they're only doing the uh, removal they're not doing the smelting um, they send the uh, the material out uh, to other places that are nearby that have smelting uh, facilities. But um, if you look at this ever increasing river of uh, sludge that is slowly leaking down from this mine, um, the uh, it, it's so bad. As a matter of fact, the government of Norway divested itself from Rio Tinto shares and banned further investment due to the environmental concerns and um, and that basically is because of the severe environmental damages that are related to Rio Tinto running this mine so these guys are not good corporate are not good uh, citizens they're not you know if they 
If a corporation is a person, these people should be put in jail, as far as I'm concerned, for what they've done already. And I don't think that we should be giving them a place, and this is just me, and I'll speak for me. I don't think we should be giving them a place at the table. I don't think that we should be giving them access to our uh, natural resources at all. Uh, go see if anybody had anything to say. I get this thing to work here. Weren't they impeaching the Brazilian uh, president for stuff like this? Uh, yeah, uh, there's been all kinds of upheaval because of this. Um, of course, it just happened in on November the 5th, so the full scope of everything um, uh, is uh, something that um, uh, is going to unfold as the days go by. But, you know, because it's only been, it's been a little, little bit under a month, and uh it being in, in such a remote area, it's difficult to assess how much of the damage um, anybody's ever going to be able to fix. Ever. Ever, ever. Uh, Celeste asked me, how the hell did I learn this, let alone retain all this information? Well, a lot of it's because I've lived in all of the lower 48 states and in Alaska. Um, but that's another story for another day. Um, I had I had a bucket list at 17, so I uh, I, I exercised my uh, ability to at that point still get around, and um, it was an interesting. Um, I worked in a gold mine, an open pit gold mine, uh, just north of Phoenix, uh, driving one of those big trucks for a while. So I kind of know some of this stuff anyway. Um, and so, John, if you could uh, start, because there's I don't see any other questions. Um, I go back and look here, see if there's anything else. So, okay. So, if you could uh, uh, key up the first legislation one. Um, so, we've got some legislation. This is this is what we're fighting. I told you how we got here. Now I'm going to tell you where we are right now. Right now, we've got two pieces of legislation, uh, one in the House, one in the Senate, that are uh, to uh, remove this um, Oak Flat Amendment from the, um, the uh, uh, Defense Spending Bill before, it's, before Rio Tinto gets their hands on it and we go so far down the road that there is no return. And uh, Senator Grijalva, who is one of the um, the is the senator who sponsored the or is the representative who sponsored the bill in the House to save Oak Flat, held a uh, a forum in um, uh, just a few weeks ago. It was maybe the fourth, November the fourth. And uh, to get some information out, uh, basically part of the uh, push to get the uh, Senate bill in on November the 5th. So, John, if you could run that, please. Welcome, and uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, let me welcome Council Cardenas. Other members will be coming in. Ostensibly, it's around a piece of legislation, the repeal of Section 3003 that was in the National Defense Authorization that was a must-pass piece of legislation that the President signed, and within that was Section 303, was, which expedited the land transfer in Arizona. And in the process of expediting that, the situation at Oak Flats, which now essentially, as that trade moves forward, becomes private land, inaccessible to many, in particular the Native people nationally, and San Carlos Apache tribe in particular saw this as a, as a serious violation of sacred sites and more importantly as a desecration of a sacred site with ancestral connections that go back millennium. And so we felt that because of the way it was done in the middle of the night to put that there and move forward that we would give it an opportunity to have our colleagues join with us, and many of us have, to move to repeal of that section 
within the authorization, the defense authorization. Number one, that's the that's ostensibly where we're at. But I think uh, many of the you hear from today will be particular to uh, Oak Flats. But I think there's 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 some bigger issues at stake here in terms of what this means to Indian country, in terms of sacred sites, and what it means to uh, protect Native American religious and sacred sites as a whole. Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, American Indian Religious Freedom Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, Executive Order 13175 Consultation, with Indian tribal governments, Executive Order 13007, Indian sacred sites. All those have an impact on this issue as a whole. And for many uh, individuals across Indian country and many uh, tribal leadership across Indian country see this as a very, very dangerous precedent going into the future and, and have rallied to support Oak Flat and the people that are fighting that issue. I want to say also that as we go forward, and you hear the testimony today, that, that I think that it's also crystallized something very important. The role in, you know, people give a lot of lip service to self-determination and sovereignty and on and on and on. Uh, but in reality, when we have these kinds of very trades to a foreign-owned mining company, multinational corporation that affects the direct descendant history of this nation in a very direct and personal and spiritual and sacred way, that we do that at the expense of our own legacy as a nation and our own values as a nation. So this is an opportunity for many of us, not only in Congress, to come to grips with this issue. And as we go forward, make sure that the federal laws and policies designed to protect Native American religious and sacred areas and sites are upheld, are respected, and given the status in any discussion. Welcome. Okay, so this is uh, what's going on in the House. They're busy uh, trying to uh, get the senators and the representatives um, versed in the native uh, perspective and um, understanding how these laws should be protecting this land and how Rio Tinto has managed to skirt itself around these protections and the importance of rescinding the land swap. Um, I mean, they own the lease on, uh, on, on Tonto National Forest land. But doing the land swap gets them out from underneath all these other laws that would hold uh, them accountable for, uh, pre you know, at least trying to prevent um, some of the uh, uh, environmental damage that you just saw pictures of. And John, if you could get that next uh, video ready. Um, in August, uh, one of the Rio, one of the Oak Flat um, uh, protesters was uh, asked to speak at a uh, Bernie uh, Sanders uh, for President rally in Tucson, and um, both she and uh, uh, Representative Grijalva and um, Bernie Sanders spoke on this issue, and uh, I have a little clip of that for you. Apache girl, as an Indian girl, you know, I really want to thank Bernie Sanders for letting me be here today, because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. But I am. I'm here with the Native people, with our voices to be heard, finally, for once. But tonight we're standing here as our voices are being heard because sacred land, sacred areas, and sacred things that we hold to our hearts, who we are as our identity, is being destroyed by corporations. It's being destroyed from something about greed, something that this thing
being this entity that is being taken taken away our sacred lands and taking who I am away as a young girl and who I am as in what I want to believe as Yosin, God the Creator. So I stand here in front of you guys asking you to look up the Sable Flat Act so that this bill that was passed as a Midnight Rider in the National Defense Authorization Act to take away this sacred land, to take away public land and put it as private land for a foreign mining company that wants to destroy this land for money. But we the people are strong. We the people here stand as one. We are in a new era where we don't look at each other as different color because we are all human beings. We are all children of God. Sanders who supports this, who supports our people and supports the people so that our voices will be heard in this country because this is what this country is about. It's the freedom of who we are, the freedom of religion, the freedom to believe in anything that we want because we are the American people. But if this land gets taken away, that is destroying our rights as human beings, our natural born rights as who we are as a person. And we're not going to let that happen. And this is why we need a new leader like Bernie Sanders to come with us. The, the issue of Oak Flats transcends Oak Flats. It's about, it is about the first Americans receiving the respect, the sovereignty, and the decency to be treated as first Americans. We have done rallies all over this country and we've had great people, trade unionists, environmentalists, women's advocate, introducing us. But I have never heard people, young people, give the kinds of introductions and statements that I heard tonight in Tucson. Naylin Pike, who reminds us of how much we owe to the first Americans, and that we will protect them. And Bernie kept that promise. He, uh, in uh, November, November the 5th, uh, introduced a uh, bill co-sponsored by Tammy Baldwin and uh, Senator, and I want to make sure I get this name right here, Heinrich, uh, who's a senator in New Mexico, uh, co-sponsored a bill, to, which is the companion bill. So we now have a bill in the House, we have a bill in the Senate. And they're both working towards trying to get to remove the Oak Flat language and nullify it so that Oak Flat ownership will not pass into private hands. And so, um, John, if you could get the Heinrich uh, the legislation video three um, up and ready to go because I know we're running a little long, so I'll try to be a little less wordy. No worries. This is good stuff. I'm good to go for the long haul. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, I think that you'll find this interesting. You'll find out some things. that I you know I was shocked when I was listening to it. So I was actually looking for the November 5th uh, introduction of the bill uh, from Senator Sanders, and of course, you know, those things are all kind of housekeeping and C-SPAN probably ran them live but cut them out of the archive tape. And instead I found this. And what I find interesting about this is, first of all, uh, the senator, the second one that you see speaking, is one of the co-sponsors of uh, the uh, Senate uh, Saboke Flat, Heinrich. Uh, and the other thing is is that this is an example of how when you legislate you not only legislate you can't just react you've got to be proactive 
and they're going to be talking about a proactive bill that's going to fix some things so that at least if um, the uh, mining companies are going to try to go in uh, we're going to get some benefit out of it and we're going to get some guarantees that they're not going to be just uh, pillaging um, our, our resources. So John if you could go ahead and roll that. I rise today to introduce the Hard Rock Mining and Reclamation Act of 2015. First, I want to thank Senator Heinrich, who will be here with me in a moment and be speaking, uh, for working with me on this bill. We are proposing this bill for one reason, to reform the mining law of 1872. The 1872 mining law played a historic role in the settling of the West. It encouraged mining for silver, gold, copper, uranium, and other minerals on public lands. It helped the West to grow, but there was a price, one we are still paying. It did almost nothing to compensate the public, it did nothing to protect the environment, and it did nothing to require mines to clean up the mess. It did nothing to require those mines to clean up the mess. The legacy is clear. Thousands of abandoned mines, contaminated land, polluted streams, costly cleanup, and taxpayers stuck with the bill. We have a 19th century law which is totally inadequate to 21st century challenges. There are up to 500,000 abandoned mines in our country. They are a ticking time bomb. They are leaking toxins into our rivers and streams in the West and have been for decades. It will cost tens of billions of dollars to fix this. Anywhere, the estimates say from 20 billion to 54 billion dollars with a B, billions. A mining royalty will bring fairness to taxpayers and help pay for the cleanup. Because I believe in a simple principle, the polluter pays, the polluter pays. But under current law, the mining companies do not pay, not for the minerals they take, not for the damages they have done. This cannot continue. They cannot continue to reap all the benefit and hundreds of millions of dollars while taxpayers continue to shoulder all the burden. Madam President. The Senator from New Mexico. There are estimates that 40 percent of western watersheds have been polluted by toxic mining waste, toxins leaking silently out of thousands of abandoned hard rock mines are doing even more damage to our watersheds each and every year. It's high time that we as a Congress overhaul our abandoned mine cleanup policies to make future disasters less likely and to address the thousands and thousands of abandoned mines that are polluting our watersheds. A large reason why the Navajo Nation lacks adequate resources and why communities all across Indian Country and the entire West are dealing with pollution from abandoned mines and lack resources is that we have not updated our federal laws on hard rock mining in 143 years. 143 years. Now during the era of manifest destiny, the, the federal government encouraged Americans to settle newly acquired lands in the West by passing laws. Laws like the Timber and Stone Act of 1878 and the Desert Land Act of 1878. Some of these laws gave away public lands and resources to private users with no strings attached and often no price tag attached. The General Mining Act of 1872 came along during this era of unrestrained Western expansion. It allowed individuals and companies to claim ownership of minerals in the public domain, minerals owned by us as a nation, gold, silver, copper, uranium, molybdenum, and others, simply by locating a mineral source, staking a claim, and paying five dollars for an acre of land. Miners did not have to consider environmental impacts or make plans to clean up the waste that they left behind. Waste which has created the pollution 
and the contamination that we confront today. But short-sighted policy also left behind a scarred legacy on our lands. Unlike other 19th century Western settlement laws, which have long since been reformed or replaced, the Mining Act of 1872 remains on the books today. While developers of resources like oil and natural gas and coal all pay royalties to return a fair value to taxpayers for our public resources, hard rock, hard rock mining companies still mine publicly owned minerals for free. For free. So, about the only people who got anything out of this are probably the senators and the representatives who tucked that, uh, that rider into uh, the defense bill. Because as taxpayers, it's another example of where we are subsidizing corporations that don't need to be subsidized. If these multinational corporations want to come in and try and get our, uh, our natural resources, the least, the very least that we can get, we, we, we should expect to be able to get, is recompense. The money, you know, we, we should be making some of the money because this is coming out of public land. This is our tax dollars paid for this land, pay for the upkeep, pay for uh, the monitoring for, you know, fire and, and all those things. Okay. We paid for them year after year after year in the case of Tonto National Forest since 1937. That's our, that's our land. Uh, and I'm talking as not as a native now, I'm talking as a U.S. citizen. This is our land. Remember the song I started out with, okay? And our law is such that for, you know, the price that you would pay for a uh, Little Caesars pizza, five bucks, you can go plunk down in a uh, uh, five dollars and you can be a miner. You can dig down as far as you want. You can do whatever the heck you want. You can uh, make a big mess and then you can leave. And if you can do a land swap and uh, swap some land uh, over here for that land over there, it's your land and there are then no environmental, NEPA, nothing applies to you anymore. And you can do whatever you want to. And I think that, you know, that's probably not a good way to run things and it's something that ought to change. So I brought that bill to your attention so that you can... Um, um, throw maybe your support behind it. Let folks know that it's out there. The entire um, uh, session of introducing that bill is in the uh, description on this broadcast. It's about 24 minutes long and uh, I'm looking for the name of it right now. Um, there's uh, Hard Rock Mining Legislation Reform is, an, is its name. And there's a long one and a short one. And if you subscribe to uh, my channel, which is Pat Spray, you can um, find those, uh, those, those videos fairly easily. And you get to get a jump on um, seeing what I'm putting together for next week because I upload my uh, clips and videos and things to that channel. Um, so what can we do? Well, first of all, I'm going to look and see if anybody has any more questions or comments before I get to what we can do. Um, yes, the whole, the whole system is corrupt, Michael Stapleton. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, this isn't just something that Black Lives Matter activists yell. The whole damn system is corrupt. And, um, we need to, uh, deal with this. Um, it makes people, yeah, it does make me wonder, Celeste, why more people aren't pissed off. And I think part of it is because the information is just not out there. Or if it's out there, it's in a form that it can be dismissed. Now, I just spent an hour and 20 minutes 
going through this whole thing so that you would get a big picture of the history and what we're talking about and you know obviously on all of the things I talked about I, you could go even further in depth what chemicals what uh, the concentrations of uranium that they might expect to find and, and so on you can all of those things could be gone to in depth. This is just a really high level um, discourse on, on what's going on. And it took an hour and 20 minutes. Well, most people with their 30 second attention spans, shit, you know, you're lucky if you can get their attention long enough to click on a link, let alone to uh, sit and watch an hour and 20 minutes. Um, what we need to do is if you go and look in the um, the description down where it says take action there's uh, a section uh, sign pledges and petitions there's I mean at the very least if this is all you can do if this is all you have time to do if this is all the people who follow you on social media can do click on these links sign the petitions Urge your members of Congress to co-sponsor the Save Oak Flat Act, whether they're the representatives or the senators. If you click on that link, it asks you to uh, enter your zip code. It takes you to a place where they've listed all your uh, senators and representatives, and um, you just they've got a form email, and you can add what you want to on to the description. And I suggest you do it right after the song. Um, because the song's going to get you a little bit fired up and go out there and tell them just exactly what you think about this and why they should co-sponsor this uh, Save Oak Flat Act. And it's not just an Indian thing. It's an environmental thing. And these people shouldn't be trusted with anything, let alone be trusted with uh, uh, our, our public lands. Um, the other thing you can do is sign the petition to protect Oak Flat, and that's another easy click um you know click click and you're done take these and kite them around uh, uh social media this entire month uh you know every every day when you get up click tweet it out put it on facebook put it on uh snapchat or pinterest or imger or imager or any of those things that you do make a meme put a link with it um there's you know the folks that are watching this broadcast and that have stuck with it this long you're the people that have got to get this out there there's only just you know a few Indians we seem to be the only ones that are interested there's only a few people in Superior they're the only people that seem to be interested we need to get everybody else if everybody else knew about this there'd be more people hollering about this than there were about KXL but um it's just not getting airtime. If you're willing to get a little bit more involved, I put together two pages, and this is under the Get Involved heading. And um, you can contact 13 members of the Subcommittee on Indian Insular and Alaska Native and um, Affairs. You can call them. You can Facebook them. You can Twitter. I added all their Twitter handles. I think there's only one that doesn't have one out of the, the 35 people that have uh, any kind of uh, of control over what's going on at this bill, with this bill at this very moment. It's in committee in the House. Um, if you click on the link next to Take Action, there's a web page. You just click on the links one after another and, you know, go to post on their Facebook. If their Facebook isn't allowing posts, make up a post on your Facebook and tag them. But try to get them to see that you want that you are adamant that they need to support HR Bill to twenty uh, eight eleven or uh, the Senate Bill twenty two forty two, and um, of course you know the, we've got now forty members of the House that are co-sponsoring um, the, uh, the 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 Save Oak Flat Bill in the House. We only have three we have the two sponsors the two co-sponsors co and Bernie Sanders who is the um, the sponsor of the bill for uh, the one in the Senate 
talk to them, ask them, ask them why they, you know, ask them too, ask them why they have it, ask them if they know about it, um, use your, um, your abilities to persuade people to uh, try and get shift the, um, the, the Congress critters into thinking that maybe they probably ought to support this because there's a lot of people that are looking at it. And then if you scroll down a little bit further, <coughs> Rogue Rahova is running for, um, will be running for the House, and he's trying to raise money for this uh, fund. Um, for his fund, so if you want to donate to him, if you got a couple extra bucks, that's fine. If not, you know, everybody understands that it is the Christmas season. Um, if you're in the Arizona area, or you have family or know people in the Arizona area, the uh, 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 urgent support needed, Apache's Oak Flat, they're having a 4th Avenue um, they're going to be doing uh, what we would call in political law uh, circles tabling. They're going to be at a uh, street fair um, next week, I believe. And they, they post all of their actions at this link. So you might want to book, bookmark the uh, blog spot link so that uh, you can uh, keep track of what's needed. Um, obviously, Apache Stronghold, who's running the, uh, the camp, they're trying to stay, uh, keep an encampment going to try to prevent any uh, further um, uh, destruction of the area until we can get these uh, legislative uh, issues going gone through. And uh, these are the things that we can do. These are the things that have to be done. We need to get people involved, and we need to get people headed in this direction. So take to social media, spread the word. I mean, it's not just an Indian thing, okay? It's an everybody thing. And um, that is really, unless somebody has any questions, that's uh, I'm finally run dry. You've uh, pretty much gotten everything out of me that I have. Um, I'm checking the, uh, the comment uh, moderation uh, area right now. And um, so, John, um, I guess kind of everything's kind of caught up. So if you want to get the song that we're going to be running for tonight ready, uh, it's Drasis. The song is Warpath. And uh, I'm going to ask you, you going to ride with me? Go. First, you should know that I have risen through the fire in colorful buckskin. The object of my desire is the color of my skin, so divided on my kin. Watch me turn the tables to be eating like some kings in beautiful headdresses. The culture is so impressive. I'm just hoping I absorb it when he passing me the message. Cause baby, it's depressing living in this mess we call a home. We should take it back and choke his resting on the collarbone. Arrowheads right along the enemy like styrofoam. Piercing through the strongest arm of death and genocide of foam. And still I stand. A singular red man with Jupiter size heart Forever repping my clan The Eagles and no man Watching over my plans Talking real shit Baby, no fake in here for the fans I'm shouting out Bobby Jones My auntie, my mushroom George I'm drawing all of my strength For my people here before me, man Bro. Big chief in the building Everybody take your place Bro. Remove your feelings If you wanna ride with me Bro. You about to go to war right now No petty ass beef when it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? 
Blessed is the man with sons who walk beside him. There's not enough leaders out there we should be riding. They left our people broken, but homie, don't play the possum. Learn to grow yourself to set, cause you can bet there's nothing promised. They say it, I'm a problem. They call me public enemy, but they don't understand that. I hold it down for my family, and I hate it when they say that. I won't be sh cause I'm native, cause in my mind, we the strongest. We were built up for the ages. Hey, hey, give me back mine for I take that. You don't want that with my brains at. Put them up high with a brain to the sweet grass. Put a prayer up if you ain't gonna ride, get back with your weak ass. No room for the weak or the type of speech that brings us down. Need them soldiers to be strong when the bad man comes to town. Ride that. Big chief in the building, everybody take your place. Remove your feelings if you wanna ride with me. We about to go to war right now, no petty ass beef. When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? When it all go down, who's gonna ride with me? Huge.